Good afternoon. I am Dr. Macias Moriarty from the School of Pharmacy at South University. We're very, very excited this afternoon, this Friday afternoon, to talk to you about COVID-19, just the facts. We have an exceptional group of health professions faculty members, uh, members of the Health and Wellness Committee, and uh, we're going to go ahead and provide you an amazing presentation and hopefully very informative presentation on COVID. Uh, our chair of our committee is, of course, uh, Dean Scarborough, the Dean of College of the Dean of College of Health Professions. Um, Dr. Andrews is also on our committee from the nursing faculty from Richmond, uh, Dr. Costell, who is the program director and associate professor in, of health sciences and public health from Virginia Beach. Myself, I am an associate professor in pharmaceutical sciences at the School of Pharmacy on the Savannah campus. Dr. Pereira is an assistant professor in pharmacy practice at the School of Pharmacy in Savannah. Professor Smithhurst is the director of the didactic education and the physician assistant program. And of course, Professor Tucker from the undergraduate nursing, nursing professor from the Columbia campus. Thank you everybody and welcome. Today, Professor Smithhurst is going to go ahead and get us started, providing us with the objectives of the presentation as well as a general overview. Thank you and welcome. Um, so just very briefly going to go over the objectives for today's presentation. We'd like to provide an overview of COVID-19. Certainly we've all had a steep learning curve with this over the course of the last year. So we're going to talk about the epidemiology of the disease, the common symptoms, the currently available treatments, as well as the vaccinations with a little background information about the uh, trials that have been going on to get these vaccines to market. And then we'll wrap up with the South University uh, response to COVID-19 over the course of the last year and looking forward. Um, Professor Smithhurst, before we move forward, I want to make sure that everybody types in their questions under the question mark box as you go in. If anything pops into your mind, please type that in and let us know. At the end, we will have 10 minutes to go ahead and address any of your concerns and questions. Thank you, Professor. I appreciate the interruption. No worries. Okay, so we've all had to learn a brand new language this year. So what's in a name? So the first term that we all heard about at the beginning of 2020 was COVID-19. So what does that even mean? So the CO stands for Corona. The VI, VI stands for virus. The D stands for disease and 19 indicates 2019, which is when the virus was first discovered. Um, so the pathogen or cause of COVID-19 is actually now uh, termed SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and this indicates that uh, SARS meaning the severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, the CoV part indicates that we have a coronavirus causing the respiratory syndrome, and number two indicates that this is the second of its type that was discovered. Uh, this notation is given by the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. And both terms can be used interchangeably. Uh, so what is a coronavirus? Well, these viruses are essentially named for their appearance. Uh, they have crown-like projections on these spikes. We've all learned about these protein spikes as we've been paying attention to coronavirus in the media. Uh, so it is thought that these little uh, ends on those spikes look like crowns, and the Latin word for crown is corona. There are seven known coronaviruses that can infect human beings. Four of them cause very mild colds, uh, mild respiratory symptoms like sore throat, cough congestion. And we now have three that can cause rather severe illness in human beings. You may remember hearing in the media in previous years about MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome, and this is also caused by a coronavirus. Uh, we had a SARS outbreak, which is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, the first one to be discovered. And now our current pandemic uh, is the second severe acute respiratory syndrome that's caused by coronavirus. So what makes COVID-19 so unique? Well, it's a novel virus. You might have heard that term, and simply that means that it's new. 
uh, we had not encountered this type of virus before, especially in human beings. Um, it is believed that perhaps this virus did jump species. So it may have started uh, in other mammals and then made its way to human beings uh, sometime around 2019. Um, it is highly contagious and unfortunately causes severe symptoms uh, and death in some patients who are more prone uh, to those um, deleterious effects. And interestingly, those little spikes, the little coronas at the end um, of the spikes on the virus itself are what help it adhere to human cells, making it a very efficient infectious agent. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Castle. I'm the Academic Program Director for Health Sciences and Public Health. And today I'm going to talk about the epidemiology of COVID-19. So when an infectious, new infectious disease is discovered, scientists called epidemiologists work with other scientists to find who has it, why they have it, and what they can do about it. From the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, scientists around the world have been working to identify the source of the outbreak, monitor and track the disease, study the disease, and then develop guidance to slow the spread of the disease. As diseases emerge, the first role of an epidemiologist is to identify the source of the, the infection. The novel coronavirus that first appeared in Wuhan, China, had never been seen before, so it quickly gained the attention of scientists around the world. Epidemiologists perform field investigations to find out how the new virus started. They conducted surveys in the community and in health facilities and collected nose and throat specimens for lab analysis. These investigations showed them who was infected, when they became sick, and where they had been just before they got sick. Using this information, it was determined that the virus possibly came from an animal sold at a market and was most likely transferred from bats to humans. As COVID-19 began spreading in Wuhan, China, it became an epidemic. An epidemic is a sudden increase in cases, and then because the disease then spread across several countries and affected a large number of people, it was then classified as a pandemic. Epidemiologists must utilize this disease data to understand high risk and vulnerable populations. These groups include older populations and individuals with pre existing conditions. So, comorbidities such as autoimmune disease, cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases. Once the source, cause, and the highest at risk groups have been identified, scientists must create a plan to control the disease. So, this plan has included measures such as wearing of masks the avoidance of touching your face, washing hands thoroughly with soap and water, as well as our six feet social distancing guidelines and protocols. As the virus that causes COVID-19 began to spread from person to person in communities, which is known as community transmission, scientists needed to track the disease and try to slow its spread. To do so, they needed a common definition for a case of COVID-19. So having a case definition helps to make sure cases are counted the same way everywhere. So in the United States, a confirmed case of COVID-19 is defined as a person who tests positive for the virus that causes COVID-19. COVID-19 became a nationally notifiable disease, meaning that health departments are required to report those cases. And then this data is utilized to monitor cases within states and across the country. So as cases of COVID-19 are being reported, epidemiologists are conducting public health surveillance, the systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health data. So this surveillance allows us to calculate things such as incidence, which is number of new cases reported over a specific period of time, prevalence, which is defined as the number of cases at one specific point in time, hospitalization, so number of cases resulting in hospitalization, and then death, number of cases resulting in death. But surveillance isn't just about counting cases. All kinds of information can be collected to learn more about the disease. So these data might include demographic information, age, race, ethnicity, sex, as well as symptoms, treatment, and health outcomes. So scientists can use chart abstractions to learn who's more likely to become severely ill, what medical care patients have received, and if patients have recovered. Once scientists collect and analyze the data, experts in data visualization help to create pictures, charts, and graphics to make the information easier to understand and use. This information is not only helpful for scientists working to understand the information, but also very public, I'm sorry, also very important for the public's understanding. Displays of epidemiological data often include something known as an epi curve. 
An epi curve shows what has happened, including the number of cases, hospitalizations, or deaths over time. And epi curves for COVID-19 are being updated constantly as new data becomes available. Because there is a delay between when someone gets sick and when that person's case is reported, it can be hard to determine when cases actually start to decline. So an epi curve for the most recent few weeks might look like an outbreak is ending even when it is still active. So the full shape of the curve is only clear after the outbreak is fully over. Scientists and public health workers are also working to stop the spread of COVID-19 through contact tracing. In this strategy, public health workers talk to people with COVID-19 to learn about all the people they were uh, physically close to while they were potentially able to spread the disease. Those people are their contacts. With this information, scientists can follow the chain of infection to understand how the disease might have spread from person to person. Contact tracing is used to prevent control of many other infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis and HIV. Using this information, we can learn through contact tracing um, and develop tables called line lists, summarizing the data about the contacts. The connection between each person is called an epidemiological or epi link. Contacts of people with COVID-19 are at higher risk for developing the disease and spreading it to others. So public health workers reach out to these people at higher risk to tell them that they have had contact with someone with COVID-19 and because of this exposure, they might get sick as well. Agencies and institutions around the world are conducting thousands of epidemiological studies to learn more about COVID-19 and the virus that causes it. These studies help us to understand things such as the time between when someone is exposed to the virus and when they can have symptoms, which is known as the incubation period. And we now know that someone can be infected with the virus for two to 14 days before they feel sick and that some people never feel sick. How long a person who is infected can shed or release the virus from the body? To avoid spreading infection, we recommend that people infected with the virus avoid being around others until they have gone three days without fever, their symptoms have cleared, and 10 days have passed since their symptoms have started. The ranges of signs and symptoms and severity of the disease, which is known as the spectrum of disease. Knowing this information helps people be on the lookout for early symptoms and helps healthcare professionals diagnose and treat this disease. And then the risk factors associated with severe disease. We now know that people who are older or have chronic um, health conditions are at higher risk for becoming sick or very sick from COVID-19. And then how often disease causes illness and death in a population, which is known as morbidity and mortality rates. This information helps epidemiologists understand the impact of COVID-19 on public health. So since the early days of the pandemic, epidemiologists have been using information from the different types of studies to develop evidence-based guidance such as wearing cloth masks to prevent the spread of the virus. And these are meant for various audiences, including healthcare providers and health departments, laboratory scientists, healthcare and long-term care facilities, schools and businesses, first responders, pregnant people and parents and travelers, and even homeless shelters and other community organizations. This guidance provides information for these various groups on how to slow the spread of the disease and protect their health. So topics may include things like testing, clinical care, preparedness and healthcare facilities, personal prevention measures, case reporting, personal protective equipment such as PPE, and daily lives and coping of living through a pandemic. So let's talk now about testing. So a viral test tells you if you have a current infection. So a viral test checks specimens from your nose or your mouth to find out if you're currently infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And there are two types of viral tests that can be utilized. The first one is known as a nucleic acid amplification mm -hmm. test. And this detects the virus's genetic material and are commonly used in laboratories. These tests are generally more accurate, but sometimes take longer to process than other types of tests. The second type of test is known as an antigen test. And so this detects viral proteins and are generally not as sensitive as nucleic acid amplification tests particularly if the antigen test is used on someone with COVID-19 symptoms. So if you have a positive or negative antigen test, your healthcare provider may need to confirm the test result with a nucleic acid amplification test. And then we have something called an antibody test. So that might tell you if you've had a past infection. Antibody or serology tests look for antibodies in your blood to determine if you've had a past infection with the virus that causes COVID-19. 
Antibodies are proteins created by your body's immune system soon after you have been infected or vaccinated, and antibodies help you fight off infections and protect you from getting that disease again. How long this protection may last is different for each disease and, of course, different for each person. Antibody tests should not be used to diagnose a current infection with the virus that causes COVID-19, except in instances in which viral testing is delayed. Antibody tests may not show if you have a current infection because it can take one to three weeks after the infection for your body to make antibodies. Whether you test positive or negative for COVID-19 on a viral or an antibody test, you still should take steps to protect yourself and others. We do not know how much protection or immunity antibodies to the virus might provide against getting infected again. Confirmed and suspected cases of reinfection have been reported, but still remain relatively rare, and scientists are working to understand this. So um, who should get tested? People who have symptoms of COVID-19, people who have had close contact so within six feet of an infected person for the cumulative total 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period with someone with confirmed COVID-19. People who have taken part in activities that put them at higher risk for COVID-19 because they cannot socially distance as needed. So such as traveling, attending large social or mass gatherings or being in crowded indoor settings. And then people who have been asked or referred to get tested by their healthcare provider, local or state health department. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandra Tucker. I'm from the College of Nursing in the Columbia campus. This condition since the beginning has been a great challenge to us in learning enough about this disease to effectively identify and prevent the spread. And there are several reasons for that. One of the wide range of symptoms and severity that we see. We know that we have individuals who have virtually no symptoms at all and don't even realize that they are ill. In contrast, we also have victims of this disease who are so severely ill that they end up requiring admission to the hospital. Many of the symptoms that we have identified of this condition also resemble symptoms of other common diseases. For example, colds or upper respiratory infections, influenza, or some gastrointestinal viruses that we frequently see throughout the fall and winter. In addition, there is a wide range of the timing for the appearance of the first symptoms of this disease. Some individuals may become ill as soon as two days after exposure to someone who has this illness, but mm -hmm. others may not begin to show symptoms until up to 14 days after exposure. So what symptoms are we talking about? Most important to recognize quickly are those that are severe or life-threatening. And these would be symptoms of new onset. For example, respiratory symptoms like respiratory distress or trouble breathing, chest pain or feelings of pressure in the chest. A new onset of confusion or disorientation the inability to stay awake, or the inability for others around you to awaken you and keep you awake. And finally, evidence of poor oxygenation, like bluish discoloration of the skin or the lips. More common amongst people who have this condition are symptoms like fever with or without chills, or even sometimes chills with no evidence of fever. Many victims have a cough, and people often ask, well, what kind of cough are we talking about here? The majority of individuals do have a dry, raspy cough with COVID-19, but up to a third of them may have a wetter cough, the kind that does produce phlegm. Many victims complain of muscle or body aches, and an increasing emphasis in, with our research is coming to look for victims who have gastrointestinal symptoms nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, as many of those turn out to have more severe course of disease. Next slide. All right. Shortness of breath or a feeling that the victim cannot get their breath. Fatigue, sometimes quite extreme. Headache, sore throat, congestion or runny nose. 
Now, these last few can give us a lot of confusion at this time of year because many victims of allergies suffer these same symptoms. Here, though, is a very unique symptom of COVID-19 that we rarely see with any other conditions, and that is the sudden new loss of the sense of taste or smell. Recent research from the CDC tells us that this may in fact turn out to be one of the most common symptoms that we see. We do know also and have learned throughout this first year of this pandemic that individuals with underlying conditions are often at higher risk for developing the disease and having a more difficult course. So when we talk about underlying conditions, what exactly do we mean? A person's age or any chronic health conditions from which they may suffer. These conditions can weaken the immune system and can also weaken the individual's overall state of health, placing them at greater risk for developing the disease and also from having a poorer outcome. These individuals turn out to be from our studies, more likely to develop the disease and more likely to have a higher incidence of severe disease and death. Looking at age, older adults have shown us that they have a higher risk for poor outcome requiring hospitalization and a higher risk from dying from this disease. Persons 85 years of age and older have been found to have the highest incidence of severe disease these are the ones who require hospitalization, admission to critical or intensive care, and will maybe be more likely to require the use of mechanical ventilation. We've also learned that eight out of 10 deaths in the US from COVID-19 have occurred in individuals 65 years of age or older. Many of these individuals have what we term underlying conditions that may increase the severity of their condition. Heart disease, such as congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease or cardiomyopathy, respiratory diseases such as emphysema or COPD, that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, individuals with type two diabetes, obesity or Down syndrome, which is often accompanied by other comorbidities. Newer research is also pointing out some other underlying conditions that place individuals at a higher risk. Sickle cell disease, chronic kidney disease, cancer, individuals with compromised immune systems, and this may come from disease states like cancer or sometimes medical therapy being used to treat these diseases. Medical therapy like chemotherapy for cancer, steroids for inflammatory conditions, and some of the new biologicals, which many of you have probably seen advertised on television, and these also have a negative effect on the immune system. We are also more concerned now about individuals who are pregnant and individuals with history of smoking. Some new research is also looking at additional underlying conditions like asthma, cystic fibrosis, persons with cerebrovascular disease with or without dementia, those with hypertension, liver disease, or type 1 diabetes. The newest research just now beginning is looking at individuals with rare and uncommon conditions, both children and adults. These, we presume, will also place individuals at higher risk but the research on these conditions is just beginning. A number of advocacy groups across the country have petitioned the CDC to prioritize this research in order to provide the best guidance to the states and their public health entities concerning vaccination and the inclusion of these individuals in the earlier phases of vaccination. These are the CDC recommendations and we've mentioned them to you previously. Get tested if you have any of the symptoms that we have just described. If you've had close contact with someone who is confirmed to have COVID-19, or if your healthcare provider has advised you to get tested.
I'm Dr. Angie Pereira, and I will be reviewing treatment options. I'm sure all of you have heard a lot of different drug names being thrown around, and our current treatment options certainly look a bit different than they did at this time last year. So I'll just be reviewing a select few treatment options that are being used most commonly at this point in time. So our only FDA approved drug currently is remdesivir, which is being used quite frequently in the hospital. The FDA approval process is quite rigorous and does require a bit of time as well as a certain amount of evidence, and so not all drugs have had the opportunity to go through this process. If that's the case, some drugs can receive what we call an emergency use authorization or an EUA. An EUA is different from the FDA approval process. So under an EUA and an emergency, the FDA makes the product available to the public based on the best available evidence without waiting for all of the evidence that would be required for an FDA approval. So some drugs that we are seeing that have received emergency use authorization are bamlanivimab with or without edizivimab. We're seeing these in the outpatient setting. We also see convalescent plasma being used somewhat within the hospital system. We also have some drugs that are being used off-label for COVID-19. So when I say off-label, what I mean by that is that these are already available products on the market, but they are available for a different indication. Um, so we have things like dexamethasone, which is a steroid product. And then we also have tocilizumab, which the brand name is Actemra. This is a product that is actually used for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but is being used off-label in COVID-19. There has been recent data available, particularly for use in our critically ill patients, which has shown improved outcomes. And so we will be seeing more of this within the hospital setting. As I mentioned, remdesivir is our only FDA-approved drug for COVID-19. It is approved for patients who are at least 12 years of age and at least 40 kilograms. To put it simply, it works by inhibiting viral replication, and it is currently recommended for hospitalized patients with severe disease severe disease, which the IDSA guidelines define as those who require supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. Both the IDSA and NIH guidelines do note that remdesivir likely has most benefit in patients who are requiring supplemental oxygen rather than mechanical ventilation. Some side effects that we can see with remdesivir are nausea and also liver toxicity, though uncommon. This is something that as a pharmacist, we do monitor daily within the hospital. Dexamethasone is a steroid, so just like prednisone or a medrol dose pack, this is something that works as an anti-inflammatory. And so its proposed mechanism in COVID-19 is that our patients that are very sick with COVID-19 are in a hyper-inflammatory state. And so using an anti-inflammatory can help to address this. This is also just like remdesivir recommended for hospitalized patients with severe disease. So again, that's gonna be those who require supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. We actually do see this used quite frequently in combination with remdesivir. Moving more to the outpatient setting, we do have some monoclonal antibodies, and they work to prevent virus attachment to human cells, so they prevent that virus from entering our own cells. This drug combination of bamlanivimab and edizivimab has received an emergency use authorization just last month. Prior to that, bamlanivimab on its own actually had received an EUA, I believe it was back in November. And so bamlanivimab has actually been being used in the outpatient setting for quite a bit of time now. Uh, but just recently, there has been some data that has come out on the combination showing that it has decreased uh, hospitalization for outpatients who received this drug. And so both the IDSA and NIH guidelines are recommending this combination for a select group of outpatients. So particularly those who have mild to moderate disease, of course, not requiring hospitalization, but are also high risk for progression to severe disease. And they define high risk as being patients who have any one of the following. So a BMI of greater than or equal to 35, if they have certain comorbidities, such as chronic kidney disease, diabetes, any sort of immunocompromising condition, those who are age 65 years or older, 
or if they're age 55 years or older and have any of the following conditions, so cardiovascular disease, hypertension, or COPD. I've included convalescent plasma here just because I feel like it's gotten a lot of conversation about it. I feel like a lot of people have been talking about convalescent plasma. And the idea behind it is really that patients who have recovered from COVID-19 have developed antibodies against the virus, whereas somebody with an active infection hasn't yet had the ability to develop those antibodies. And so if we collect plasma from those who have recovered from COVID-19, we're able to get those antibodies and we can infuse them into a patient that has an active infection and sort of jumpstart that immune in response by providing the antibodies that the patient has not yet had time to develop so that they can attack the virus. There has been a, a mix of information about whether or not convalescent plasma is actually beneficial within hospitalized patients. And so currently the IDSA and NIH guidelines only recommend its use in context of a clinical trial. Moving on to COVID-19 vaccines, which I know is quite a hot topic these days, I'll just briefly be reviewing a little bit of background on the vaccines, and then my colleague will be diving into some of the trial information. Um, so there are three different types of coronavirus vaccines that are currently in development. So if we take a look at the image of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we can see those orange spikes coming off of it, which was mentioned earlier. That's the spike protein, which provides a unique target for potential vaccines and therapies. And so some vaccines in development are protein-based. And what that means is that protein-based vaccines include a harmless piece of the virus instead of the entire virus. So in the case of COVID-19, that would be that spike protein. So we would purify that spike protein, inject it as a vaccine, and then our body would recognize that spike protein as being foreign, develop an immune response, and produce antibodies against that spike protein. So if the SARS-CoV-2 virus were to enter the body, we would recognize that spike protein and the antibodies would know to attack it. I'm gonna move on to number three because I feel like it helps me explain number two a little bit. So number three is an mRNA vaccine, which we do have a couple of those that have currently received emergency use authorization. And the way that works is that mRNA vaccines provide the cell with instructions to make that spike protein. So the vaccine teaches our cells to make that spike protein. Our body then produces that spike protein. And again, that initiates that immune response as it recognizes the spike protein as being foreign, and we're able to produce antibodies against that virus. Now moving back to number two, a viral vector vaccine. It is somewhat similar to an mRNA vaccine in that it gives the cells genetic instructions to produce that spike protein. The difference here is that it uses a harmless virus to deliver those instructions into the cell rather than using the mRNA. So in the case of the Janssen vaccine, it uses an adenovirus and that helps, um, that delivers those instructions to the cell. The cell is then able to use its own machinery to produce that spike protein. And once again, we recognize that as being foreign, our body has an immune response and produces the antibodies against that spike protein. We currently have three vaccines that have received emergency use authorization. So that's gonna be the Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen vaccines. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both mRNA vaccines. They are both a two-dose series. Pfizer, the doses are given 21 days apart, and with Moderna, those are given 28 days apart. Johnson & Johnson, which is the newest vaccine to receive an EUA, is actually a viral vector vaccine, and that's given as just a single dose. So some important things to note about COVID-19 vaccination. Um, we know that really the main point is to help preventing prevent getting sick with COVID-19. As we know, COVID-19 can come with a lot of complications. We really wanna prevent ourselves from being infected with the COVID-19 virus. People who have gotten sick with COVID-19 will still benefit from getting vaccinated, and the CDC still recommends that these patients do so. We actually had a question yesterday asking about the immune response to the vaccine for patients that have already had a COVID-19 infection. 
Um, though we do need more data on this topic, there was a small study that was done that has shown that patients who have already been infected with COVID-19 actually have at least equal to or a greater immune response than patients who receive the vaccine and have not previously been infected with COVID-19. It's also important to understand that COVID-19 vaccines cannot give you COVID-19. We are not injecting the virus into the body, so there is no way for you to develop the virus. You may feel sick after receiving the vaccine, and that's just because your body is creating that immune response, which can sometimes make you feel those symptoms of, you know, maybe having a fever, chills, headache. COVID-19 vaccines will also not cause you to test positive on a COVID-19 viral test. So remember that the viral test is the test that tests for active infection. Because we're providing you with the vaccine with the purpose of developing antibodies, um, you would test positive on an antibody test. So not only is the COVID-19 vaccine important for you to be able to create an immune response against the virus, it's also very important to get because it can help you from getting severely ill even if you do get the if you do get COVID-19. So the vaccines are not perfect. They are not 100% efficacious, although the efficacy is quite good. There is still a chance that you could get COVID-19, but having gotten the vaccine can help prevent you from getting a severe course of the disease. Hello, again, this is Lilia Macias Moriarty, and I'm an epidemiologist um, at the School of Pharmacy. And I am gonna to talk to you about vaccine clinical trials. Now, to give us perspective as to how big these studies are, I'd like for us to look back at the longest running study in the United States, which is actually the Framingham Heart Study, which began in 1948, um, and it is still going on. It is still going on. It is still funded by the National Institutes of Health. And the total number of individuals in this study, referred to as the sample size, is actually 15,000 individuals, which is a gargantuan prospective cohort study. Having said this, can you imagine now we have these clinical trials where we are talking about tens of thousands of individuals who are in involved in these studies as study participants. Very briefly, we're going to talk about generalizability. So what is generalizability? Generalizability is a measure of how useful the results of a study are for a broader group of people or situations. So if the results of a study are broadly applicable to different types of people in different situations, it's referred to as good generalizability. It and when the results have applied to a very narrow group of individuals, very specific situation, then it's considered having poor generalizability. When we think about random, people use this word all the time. How random? So what are we talking about? We're talking about things that are left to chance alone, right? So when we talk about randomization, we're talking about the chance alone determined what group a person was put into. By leaving it up to chance, we help ensure that the groups start off in equal footing. In terms of all these studies being stratified, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, we talk about how the study participants were randomly placed in either the vaccine group, which is the intervention group, or the placebo group, which means they received nothing or a saline solution injected into them. But then the, all the studies took the additional step in their methodology to do a stratified random sample. That means that the researchers purposely selected individuals of different age, different race ethnicities, and different underlying conditions to be representative of the general population. So as we talk about the three big studies, okay, let's talk, about, let's compare and contrast the Pfizer with the Moderna with the Johnson & Johnson Janssen um, vaccines. All of them, as I said, were stratified double-blinded placebo-controlled trials. The Pfizer study had 43,000 participants, the Moderna had 30,000 participants, and the Johnson & Johnson had 43,000 um, study participants. Once again, that is an, exact, an enormous um, 
enormous samples that leads to its generalizability. Um, the Pfizer study enrolled everybody equal to or greater than 16 years of age. They enrolled 49% were female, 83% were white, 9% uh, were black or African American, 28% were Hispanic or Latinx, 0.5% uh, were Native American, and 4% were, were Asian. When we look at the Moderna study, they were actually 18 years of age or older, 47% female, 79% white, 10% Black or African-American, 21% Hispanic or Latinx, 0.8% Native American, 5% Asian. Now, the Johnson & Johnson, once again, similar to Moderna, enrolled individuals who were greater or equal to 18 years of age, 45% uh, female, 59% white, 19% Black or African-American, 45% Hispanic or Latinx, 1% Native American and 3% Asian. Now, where did these studies actually take place? We know that the Pfizer was actually 52 different sites worldwide, where 130 were in the United States. We had some in Latin America with Brazil and Argentina. South Africa had four sites, Germany six, Turkey nine. Um, the Moderna specifically only did their studies in the US. There were 99 sites for that. And Johnson & Johnson, had 44% were in the US, 41% were in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, and 15% were in South Africa. Now, just to, to um, release any kind of anxiety associated with the international status of those studies, remember the fact that international studies are very common. Multinational studies are something that is done all the time with tons and tons of our biomedical research. When we talk about vaccine efficacy, we know that 95%, uh, Pfizer 95% effective at presenting symptomatic COVID, uh, Moderna 94%, and Johnson & Johnson 65 now, we really didn't have any um, efficacy rates variability in demographic variables such as age, race, ethnicity when we talk about Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. Moderna was slightly lower efficacious with individuals older than 65. Having said all of this, the most important part about all three vaccine is they all produced 100% complete protection against COVID-related hospitalization and death. That's the important part here, okay? Um, it's very important to note that nobody in the studies who received these vaccines died, okay? It's very, very important to know that. Um, next slide, please. We know also when we start talking about the side effects, and many of you know someone that has already received these, um, these vaccines, we know that the side effects of the Pfizer and Moderna are very similar with pain in the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, like very similar to uh, the symptoms, uh, more common after the second dose, and they are reported to be more frequent among the younger. So kind of the younger you are, the more likely it is that you're going to have some sort of manifestation of side effect. For the Johnson & Johnson, remember that it is a different methodology. The mechanism of action is different. It's really the side effect is fever. Now I'm going to touch briefly on something called herd immunity. I'm sure you've heard this many times. Herd immunity is the indirect protection of having a large percentage of the population immune to an infectious disease. Herd immunity not only shields vulnerable populations from infection, but it also slows and potentially ends the overall spread of the disease in this small simplistic example we see the blue people the people who are blue as uh, susceptible the contagious and purple when there is no one has immunity the contagion has many opportunities to spread quickly now when the when we talk about herd immunity we know that the goal is to get as many people immune as possible when the contagion spread it converts it to susceptible individuals with an exponential speed as the contagion spreads and expand it also shrinks the number of persons who are susceptible where people can fall into the categories of a survivor or immune or a casualty of the disease in this example you see that the green are the immune individuals and by having the more immunity we have in the system the less contagion can come in contact with the susceptibles. You see that the purple individuals only touch the blue individuals, but not the green. And last but not least, people can also gain immunity with a vaccine, which is what we're all hoping for, as there's still a lot of unknowns related to whether people can get COVID-19 twice or whether 
people having COVID provides um, having COVID provides immunity, which is why the CDC's goal is to get as many people as possible vaccinated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be taking the next part. My name is Dr. Gina Scarborough. I'm the Dean for the College of Health Professions. I'm also chair for the Health and Safety Committee. Um, first of all, I'd like to express my uh, appreciation for everyone who's on this committee. We're not just a, pan a group of panelists. Uh, we meet every week. Uh, we were established, as you can see by the timeline of events, uh, in April of 2020, just after the pandemic was declared nationally, really South University jumped into action. And the uh, COVID task force overall um, is led by our chancellor, Dr. Stephen Yoho. And the health and uh, safety committee really acts uh, to accentuate and to provide um, advice to the COVID task force. And so as we all f are familiar now, uh, if we had known a year ago we would be here, uh, I don't think we would have believed it. Uh, perhaps uh, some would. But we've really progressed through the phases. Phase one, when we first started and uh, ceased offering on-campus classes, and then slowly we began uh, creating procedures and protocols and ways that people could work on campus and attend classes on campus and really help design all the different ways to keep our campuses safe. And that's what this committee has been doing in addition to the COVID task force. So the COVID task force uh, includes many of the uh, vice chancellors, it includes the director of operations. Um, I'm a representative from the health and safety. But we have other leaders from the areas of academic affairs and also campus directors and presidents. And really the entire group as well as this committee has been working pretty tirelessly to keep all of you safe. Uh, we've um, use a lot of different resources to create what you've been getting um, over the last year. How do you come on campus? What is the procedure for visitors? Can I have an event? And all of that is the work of this committee in addition to the COVID task force. And we're not making these decisions at random. They're all based on solid evidence, uh, CDC guidance, and also um, research. So, uh, that's a little bit about where the, all of the uh, different return to campus guides. Uh, our director of communications, Jennifer Flatt, has done a great job um, including all this in the website and keeping everyone updated. And as you can see from everyone's uh, credentials at the beginning, everyone on, on this committee has a lot of background in medicine, uh, pharmacy, epidemiology, nursing, public health, and uh, we all collaborate together on your behalf. A few questions we get commonly, I thought I would answer here. Uh, what is SimTim? SimTim is not a South University application. It actually is a product of a company called Infomart, uh, and they are actually a company known nationwide um, as leaders in the employee screening. Uh, we did collaborate with the COVID task force to select the application, uh, and we chose one based on its ease of use, um, its ability to use in a, you know, cell phone or a mobile platform and something that was very easy to roll out. And that was when we, we started using that at the beginning of summer quarter. So how are the questions and the rules determined? So the questions in SimTim are actually created by InfoMart, but they are based on current CDC guidance. They ha there have been a few updates along the way. You might have noticed when your app updated on your phone. And the settings when you're, it issues a remote badge or work from home badge are based on the South University guidance. For example, if you become sick or you have multiple symptoms or a fever and basically you're under suspicion of having COVID-19, it would issue you 10 days, which is the current CDC guidance for isolation. So another common question we've gotten at the Health and Safety Committee is does SimTim track my location? And unlike, um, Life 360 that lets me know where my teenager is all the time, SimTim does not do this. It does not use geolocation, and if you need to reassure yourself, um, you can always look in the phone's application settings where the application does not ask for a location permissions. Uh, it, we do know, uh, the people who have access to the system do know if you're on a campus location when you scan your badge, but that information is not widely shared and only available to certain administrators. So finally, what's next? 
Um, as you all know, the chancellor has issued uh, that we are restarting all employees on campus uh, starting in April, and that will commence phase five. And, then, and during spring quarter, the number uh, of on-campus classes will increase. Changes coming in the upcoming guidance the CDC is really changing, and you can go onto the website today. We were all looking at it yesterday, looking at the new, what we're calling the post-vaccination guidance, and some of these have already been approved by the Health and Safety Committee. There'll be new guidance coming about, about changes in quarantine required for those who have been fully vaccinated and other, and, and other rules. So at this time, we have a few minutes to take everyone's questions. I will mention that another question that came to us yesterday is, will South uh, require vaccinations? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, as you know, the chancellor sent out an email, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago, or perhaps it was last week, recommending that everyone become vaccinated. But South University at this time is not planning on requiring vaccination of employees or students. So we have a few minutes. If anyone has a question, uh, the panel is ready to um, answer. You can go ahead and submit it. Uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, I will mention that uh, 24 hours later, the um, you will get a reminder email, sort of a follow-up from our webinar, um, and it will have a video link so you could uh, watch this. And if you want like a copy, a PDF copy of the slide presentation, the Health and Safety Committee email will be on that. Well, right now we don't have any questions. Um, does anyone want to have the panel uh, have any other questions that we've been asked frequently that we could provide answers to for our audience today? Well, I think that's all we have. Well, we appreciate everyone's time and uh, we all hope you have a safe weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.